So let's talk about accessibility when it comes to HCI. There's all different kinds of accessibility that we might be interested in. Uh, people could have disabilities where they can't hear or they can't see. They may have difficulty making movements. And when we think about this, all different kinds of things play into the interfaces that we're looking at. For example, color blindness is something that becomes really important with interfaces. If we think about it outside the computer world, it's something that in situations like this becomes obvious, but that actually translates directly into things we see in interfaces. Here we have buttons across the top, lights along the side that indicate something, but if you're colorblind, it all kind of looks the same. Now imagine someone who has Parkinson's or another condition that makes fine motor movement difficult. So here I'm loading up a web page, and this web page hasn't seen me before, and so it brings up this little screen. If I want to close this and actually use the website, I need to move my mouse to this very tiny target, which for me is easy. But if you have a medical condition that makes that fine motor control difficult, hitting that target is difficult. And that's not to mention that children, for example, have a much harder time controlling different types of cursors, and so they're going to have a hard time hitting that target too. And, of course, there's a whole other set of issues to deal with when you can't see the screen at all. There are technologies to help with that, but they only work as well as they're implemented. Okay, so here I've turned on the screen reader, which is going to read... You are currently on a toolbar item palette inside of a group. To interact with the items on this toolbar, press Control, Option, Shift, Down Arrow. As you can see, it's going to read the text to us and also give us instructions on where we are. You can see that I'm focused in the search box on the top of the browser now. If I hit Tab, I can move through the page, and you'll hear what it reads for me. Leaving toolbar. Link. und curates interactive exhibits font all ages 2015 Maryland State Fair. Link. und curates interactive exhibits font all ages 2015 Maryland State Fair. I hope you're already realizing that those aren't great descriptive buttons. In terms of you are currently on a link inside of HTML content. To click this link, press Control, Option, Space. Let's keep tabbing through. Link, UMD Curates Interactive Exhibits, font for all ages at 2015 Maryland State Fair. Button. In case you don't know what that is, that's the search button over on the far right side. You are currently on a button in Link, Home, List 2 Items. Link, About, List About Academics, Fearless Ideas, 3 Items, Level 2. Link, Academics. Link, Fearless Ideas. Link, Image. UMD dash curates dash interactive dash link UMD dash curates dash interact Twitter widgets event pub frame leaving frame Twitter leaving frame link skip to main content so we can stop it there I hope that's made it pretty clear to you that interacting with a website when you're using a screen reader is a very different experience than interacting with it visually so a question becomes how do we build accessible interfaces and why is it important and of course it's important because we want everybody or the widest possible audience to have access to the interfaces, the systems, the content that we've created. But on top of that, accessible interfaces can be useful in a variety of contexts, even for people who normally wouldn't need them. So let's start by looking at a couple of those examples, and then we'll move on to looking at some guidelines for creating these interfaces. Let's start here in my car. We'll have a video of me actually showing you some of this interface in a second. But the idea here is that we talk about having touch screens. And if you're blind, a touch screen is hard to use because you don't get any feedback on where you are in the screen. It's smooth, every part feels the same. And if you can't see it, you have problems using it. So does assistive technology or alternative interfaces that would help someone who can't see a touch screen also be useful to other people? And I think the answer is clearly yes. There are times when even those of us who have no visual impairments are effectively blinded from looking at a touch screen and having alternative interfaces can be really useful to us. So the car is one example of that time. And hopefully this gives you an idea of ways that we could take technology that's designed to assist people who have disabilities and it'll be useful to an even wider audience because in certain contexts, they're essentially rendered as having the same inability to interact in the typical way. All right, guys, here we are in my car, and we're going to look at actually this system, which has a touchscreen and also some buttons. All 
All right. The two things I want to do before I die is smoke okay. and. Uh, Okay, so this is the touchscreen interface. That's it starting up. So this is what we see on this screen. If we come down here, there's some buttons. So if I hit the home button, it takes me to a bunch of different features. And then I can navigate around by touching the screen. So for example, here, it'll show me nearby gas stations, maybe. There we go. And how to get to them. I can scroll this way. I can say, look at the sound balance in the car. And you can also use it actually for the radio. So if we go back here and if we put it on XM, if I want to navigate, when I turn the knob down here, I actually can see on the touch screen what the options are. So the question is, are touch screens a good thing to have in the car? Because if I'm looking here, which is where I should be looking when I'm driving, I can't see the touch screen. And if I look down at the touch screen and move over to touch the touch screen, I'm really not looking at the road. That's why actually regular buttons are so much better to use. So I can feel this panel. I know where the buttons are here. Um, and I can also feel these buttons pretty easily. They're separated. So if I want to reach over, you know, I know NPR is the last button up here. So I don't need to look, right? I can be looking out the window and feel my way over and end up with my finger on exactly the right button. I know that these two scan and seek and we actually have a regular volume control that's a knob that you can turn. You can control the volume on the touch screen, but if you're driving, it's a really bad idea. There's also buttons in the car here on the steering wheel. Um, so this is to answer and hang up the phone to adjust the volume um, and to change the channel. So this will actually flip through the favorites. So the point here is that having physical buttons right? Things that you can push, things that you can feel, things that you can turn. They're good for people who are blind, right? Having that on a device because they don't have to be able to see what they're touching like they do on a touch screen where you have to look at it. But just because I don't have any vision problems doesn't mean I won't also benefit from that technology. When I'm driving, I should be essentially blind to the touch screen. I shouldn't be turning my attention to it and looking at it to use it because then I'm not driving. So it's an example of where technology that can support people through accessibility is actually potentially useful to those of us who don't have a disability in certain contexts. Y'all are getting kind of the full tour of my life today. This is my bike that I train on most of the time. I probably ride six to eight hours a week on the trainer down here in the basement. Um, so you can see the bikes hook up to the trainer and it's positioned in this weird way. I have it set up next to the bookshelf because when I'm on the bike, it puts my computer right in front of me. So I can be here on the handlebars and I can look at my computer. I can read text and sometimes I even want to write text. I try not to do too much on the bike where I'm typing because then my arms aren't on the bike. Um, but sometimes an email comes in or I want to take a note. And so I can use this feature on the computer, uh, which I'll show you guys in a minute, that actually will let me dictate text, uh, kind of like you do with Siri. It's a technology that most people don't use on their computer unless they have carpal tunnel or some other problem that makes it difficult to type. But in this case, it's another example of a time where I don't have any of those disabilities in a normal context, but sometimes I put myself in other contexts where for example, using my hands on the keyboard is really hard. And so technologies that are designed to make the entire system accessible to people who have a disability become quite useful to people without that disability because the context dictates how they interact. So let's take a look at how that system works with the dictation. Okay, so here we are in Microsoft Word, one place that I might use that dictation tool when I'm on my bike. I've got the headphones in so it picks up my voice really well, even with the sound of the bike trainer in the background, which we don't have to listen to now. So I have this turned on. This is a feature that's in the speech and dictation preferences of the Apple menu. So if you have a Mac, this is there for you. And all you do is hit the function key twice, 
And you'll see it's going to pop up something and hopefully it will dictate what I'm saying. Human computer interaction is great! Exclamation point. I hit the function T again and the dictation goes away. Uh, you can see it didn't get it quite right, which is, I think, a problem with most dictation systems, but it's pretty close. And if I'm writing a long piece of text, it gets a pretty decent transcription that I can then go back and edit a little bit here and there. So it's just one example of a tool that really wasn't designed for the context in which I'm using it, but it makes the system much more usable for me when I'm in that context. When we talk about designing or thinking about HCI in the context of accessibility, we think about an interface and whether or not someone has an impairment, either all the time or in a particular context, that would prevent them from using that interface the way it's designed to normally be used. Those impairments tend to come in four major categories. Cognitive impairments, where people either have reasoning abilities that don't allow them to use it, uh, this could be children who aren't able to read or think through the process in the same way that adults are, as well as a, a wide range of other cognitive abilities. We're not going to focus on that too much in this lecture, though there's a wide space of HCI research that looks at how you address different types of cognitive abilities and how interfaces should be designed around those. We'll look a little bit at impairments to hearing and motor skills, and then we'll spend quite a bit of time addressing visual impairments because that's such an important factor that comes up in both our use of the web and devices today. For people with hearing impairments, especially people with partial hearing loss, there's HCI technology out there designed to help people figure out what direction the sound is coming from. So if they want to look at the speaker to help them read lips or interpret signs, that technology actually helps them locate where the sound is coming from, even if they can't hear it, or they just don't have the ability to discern the sound enough to find its location. People with motor impairments can have a difficult time interacting with devices like touchscreens, but actually any technology in the way that they're normally designed for. This is just one example of dozens of videos you'll find on YouTube of people who have built custom adaptive things to help them do those interactions. We're not going to focus on that in this lecture, but there's a whole space of research on how you can adapt technology to work for people who have some type of motor impairments. If we're designing for people who have visual impairments, there's a common set of strategies that we're advised to take, especially when we're developing content for the web. First is just to follow some basic things. First is font controls. You want people to be able to adjust the size, color, contrast, and so on. And this is something that eventually all of us have to deal with. As we get into our 40s and 50s, our ability to read text, especially on a screen, degrades. And so allowing us to increase the font size is important. We often would see, especially 10 years ago, people who had the text put on images to put on the page. Uh, you couldn't adjust the size of that text and screen readers couldn't read it. It made it really hard for people who didn't want to read it in exactly the same size as the designer. So allow for font controls. Images should have alt tags. This is code that goes in the HTML that has a descriptive piece of text that says what that image is. As you probably saw with our screen reader example, sometimes images are missing that and we just don't know what they are. Those alt tags can also go in buttons, types of form interfaces, so someone who's using a screen reader uh, or other captioning device can get insight. Audio and video transcriptions are useful. Now this takes a lot of time, but it's really helpful. If we take a quick flip over here, this is part of a course that I teach on Coursera, a MOOC on usable security. And you can see here we have the beginning of a lecture on the different ways that you can measure usability. Coursera had all these videos closed captioned, so there's a little closed captioning link here. I have it turned on for English, and we can just take a quick look at how that reads. Not making a lot of mistakes. Here, we'll conduct a test to see if it's faster to log into an iPhone using the thumbprint recognition system or a four-digit code to authenticate. Ready? Go! So we can see it took one second to log in using the thumbprint identifier, but 4.8 seconds to log in with the four-digit code. 
Okay, so you can see that closed captioning is useful. And this is another example of where this can be useful for people even if they don't have a visual impairment. Uh, I like to think I speak clearly, but there's plenty of people who think I talk too fast or don't quite catch what I say. So the closed captioning is useful for them, even though they can see everything that's going on. Flipping back to our slides, you want to avoid things like using flash. Uh, you also want to allow keyboard access so people can tab around through your document instead of having to click. That means they don't have to look at the screen, they can actually use their keyboard. For PDFs, you want those to have optical character recognition if they're scanned. Uh, if you don't know what that means, sometimes if you have an image or you have a document that you've put through a scanner, it just basically looks like an image. You can't search the text, you can't have the text read to you. So you want to make sure your PDFs are actually searchable, speakable text. Also, you want to offer data in a basic format. So if someone's trying to look at a chart or something that you've uploaded, if they can't see it, provide the data to go along with it so your visualizations are supported with information that can be understood by people who have visual impairments. The same thing goes for things like ebooks. Better to have those come in an open format so people can, can choose their own technology instead of having to use something closed. Industry also should create tools that generate accessible content because the fact is a lot of content that's out there is not accessible right now simply because it would be hugely expensive to go back and retrofit it to be accessible. If it were built into the process to have it be accessible as it's created, suddenly a ton more data, information, and web pages would be accessible. There are tools out there that can help analyze the accessibility of an interface. This is an example of one, WAVE, the Web, web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. You can put in a web address and it will give you uh, clues about things that are potentially problematic and things that are good. We could start with our class website, which I admit I have not made a lot of effort to make accessible. Overall, it does pretty well. Uh, so I get one error, that's this red thing up here. If we look at the flags, it says that I haven't listed the language of the document, so should list that, but it's not a major error. The document's in English. Uh, anyone who gets there is going to figure that out. So that's not to say that I shouldn't list it, but it's a pretty minor error in terms of accessibility. It also says that I'm missing a first level heading, and if we jump down one, we'll see what that means. There's some structural elements that it says I should be careful about using. For example, I have an HTML table up here that's traditionally designed for tabular data. Uh, it was in the 90s and early 2000s a pretty common way to structure web pages, which I still do. So it says maybe I shouldn't use that table there. It also says that I have a level 2 heading, which is this text right here. And it says headings are supposed to kind of tell you what's going on in the structure of the content of the document. So be sure that that's what you're doing. Uh, that is what I'm doing here. And I, do, I get this error about the missing level 1 heading because I've jumped right down to level 2. Uh, I just like the way level 2 looks better. And I don't use a strict kind of outline structure for my documents. But overall, it's a pretty simple page. And so it's done pretty well on this evaluation. What I have open back here is the United States Access Board. This is the part of the government that deals with accessibility, including Section 508 standards, which handle how electronic information should be provided in an accessible way so all citizens have access to it. So let's do their website in the analysis. We're going to copy their URL and come back here and run it. They have more on their page, so it takes a little bit longer to load than mine. Okay, so we can look at the summary here. There's one error which appears over here with this button. We'll look at that in a second. There's nine alerts, 10 features, which is a good thing, 15 structural elements. If we look at the alerts, this is an empty button. And if we click on the information, it means the button's empty or it has no value text. So that means there's this button over here. We don't know what it does. Now we can look and we see it's got the magnifying glass. It's a search button. But if you're someone who's visually impaired and you can't see what the button does, all we're going to get from the screen reader is that there's a button. It's not very descriptive. So they should have more information about that. Again, not a huge error. There's nine alerts here regarding alternative text. That's text that describes what's in an image or in a button. 
Uh, some of it's redundant, some of it is the same, so you have a bunch of images next to each other, they have the same alternative text. That makes it hard for people to distinguish the difference between those images, since they all have the same thing. And there's some other missing information here. Again, nothing terribly severe, but some errors in the page. There's a lot of good stuff, though, and that shows up in the features here. And then they point out some structural elements. Are those used to structure the document? If we look at them, they're used pretty much to structure the document and not just to format the text. So there you go. They did pretty well, but even the organization that's designed to support the standards of accessibility aren't necessarily meeting all the rules that we would expect from an accessibility organization. What you are going to do in the exercise that I've assigned is turn on your screen reader, cover up your screen, either turn the brightness all the way down or put a piece of paper or something over it so you really can't see it, and try to navigate the University of Maryland website, which definitely has some accessibility problems as we saw when we were trying to use the screen reader before. In any case, if you're making a website and you want to see if you're doing things right, this is one of many tools that will evaluate its accessibility. If you're trying to evaluate accessibility for broader interfaces, you have to get a little more personal and less automated. Come up with a set of guidelines, check those guidelines against the device or the interface, and see how it's working. Colorblindness is another visual issue. A lot of people, it turns out, don't know if they're colorblind, so here's a test for you. If you can't read numbers in all five of these circles, you have some type of colorblindness. Hopefully, you can read them all and you don't. But there's actually quite a lot of people, especially men, who have colorblindness, and if you're using color as a visual cue on your page, as we saw earlier in this video, it can be an issue. At the same time, it's hard for a person who's not colorblind to really understand if their colors are going to be a problem. So I have a tool here installed called Color Oracle. It's set up for normal vision now, so we're seeing images the way they're intended to be shown. But you can pick different types of color blindness to test your page on. It simulates that for your entire system. So this doesn't just test web pages, it tests any interface that you're building on your computer. It's available for Mac and for Windows. So let's pick the most common kind of color blindness. And you can see now it's changed how the screen looks. This is green deficiency. You can see it affects about 5% of all males. And suddenly, we'll pull that back up. The numbers that we were able to see in those circles have disappeared. We can't read them. We can switch to a different kind. Here's a rarer type of color blindness. Again, we can't see the numbers that are in the circles and the page looks different than it does in normal vision. We can switch back to. Finally, here's a blue deficiency. Now, interestingly, we can read all the numbers again. In fact, in some cases, they're clearer than they were before. I actually love the color scheme of life that I would have with this kind of color blindness. Uh, but it's interesting that it makes things appear in quite a different way. So if you're emulating, for example, an app on your computer, this is one way to test the color blindness. That's Color Oracle is the name of the app, and it's a free download for you to use in your system. So there we go. This is a very high-level overview of accessibility issues in HCI, both how they come up permanently and based on context, how making accessible content can be useful to people in a variety of situations, what types of impairments to consider when you're building an interface, and some tools that are there to help you analyze accessibility for a lot of different impairments. There's more in the readings, there's more for you to discuss, and you're going to try some of these tools yourself. Hopefully that will give you a taste of a very broad space of research in HCI right now.